In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Good afternoon, everyone. Earlier today, we came together in a virtual reality setting. That is, through the medium of the internet, or live streaming, or whatever technology it was that permitted us to follow along and to participate with Father Bob as he led us, first in a prayerful meditation of the Stations of the Cross, and then in the celebration of the Eucharist. And now, as the final event of this Walk with Jesus Day of Reflection, in preparation to enter more fully into the mysteries of Holy Week, which, of course, this year will take on a very different tone because of the restrictions on our ability to participate actively in a live liturgical setting. I would like to offer a brief reflection on the significance of a person whose name is mentioned only once in the scriptures and yet whose name is forever engraved on the pages of history. A man who, according to our ordinary way of thinking, was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm referring, of course, to Simon of Cyrene, who was prodded by the Roman soldiers to help Jesus carry his cross. His story, of course, is told in the fifth station of the Stations of the Cross. As we journey together, and indeed as we suffer together, whether physically, emotionally, financially, or spiritually, through this time of restrictions on our ability to come and go as we please, I would like to propose Simon of Cyrene as a source of inspiration for how we can cope, not only during this difficult period, but also long after the present crisis is over. But before I move on to a reflection on Simon of Cyrene, I would like for you to keep firmly the image of Jesus that flashed through your mind as you prayed the Stations of the Cross, beginning from his appearance before Pontius Pilate, and then before the leaders of the Sanhedrin, and then as he was scourged at the pillar, and then stripped of his garments, then nailed to the cross. Jesus was a man who could not come and go as he pleased. As you keep this image of Jesus at the forefront of your mind, we can then reflect upon what the story of Simon of Cyrene helping Jesus to carry his cross might have to teach us today. I said a moment ago that Simon of Cyrene was a person who just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. He was just there, an anonymous person in the large crowd who had gathered to watch Jesus, whom the people earlier had denounced as a blasphemer and as being no friend of Caesar. Like many of us, he probably protested that he didn't want to get involved. But contrary to whatever other plans that he may have had for that day, carrying the cross of Jesus was definitely not on his to-do list. Forced against his will, it turns out that he was in the right place at the right time. While he himself was not aware of the full identity of this man whose cross he was compelled to carry, history remembers Simon of Cyrene as the one who helped our Savior to carry out his mission here on earth, even if his participation in that mission seemed to be so unimportant. In a book that I would highly recommend for your prayerful reflection, If not for this Lenten season, since it's already coming rapidly to a close, then certainly for next year during Lent. The author Ronald Rollheiser, a very distinguished American theologian and spiritual writer, offers some scenarios that appear frequently in the daily life of many people that may shed light on how Simon of Cyrene might help us as we try to cope with the intense challenges of this Lenten season. The name of the book to which I'm referring is entitled The Passion and the Cross. 
The author, Ronald Rollheiser, summarizes the significance of Simon of Cyrene in this manner. Simon of Cyrene was not central to the drama or the meaning of Jesus' passion and death. He was an unimportant figure who happened to be standing at the edges of things when the drama accidentally enfolded him and forced him to play an unglamorous, self-effacing, but needed role. His own agenda and plans had to be sacrificed, and his response was, no doubt, less than fully enthusiastic. Yet this unplanned for, conscripted, humble service became the most important thing he ever did, his signature piece, and gave him a place in history beyond the thousands and millions whose place in the drama of life was once deemed important. In these days of government-mandated regulations, as well as by ordinary common sense inspired by the basic demands of Christian charity that urge us to maintain a certain amount of social distancing in order to protect us from the scourge of the coronavirus, we must, however, never lose sight of the privilege that is ours as disciple of Jesus, a privilege by which we are invited to help one another to carry our crosses. And God only knows that we have crosses to carry. Here, once again, Ronald Rollheiser helps us to become more aware of opportunities that come our way. Opportunities to help carry the cross of Jesus by helping to carry each other's crosses. Rollheiser asks, how does this happen to you? How do you become a Simon of Cyrene, helping Jesus carry his cross? The cross of Jesus appears in many forms. Whenever you are the one who has to take care of an aging parent, because circumstance arranges that you are the one who happens to be living close by. Whenever you are the parent of a handicapped child, and you are asked to do things that ordinary parents aren't asked to do. Whenever you are the one to whom the emotionally needy person at work chooses to reach out to and to pour out his problems on. Whenever you are the one whose gentle nature makes it difficult to say no and consequently people take advantage of you. Whenever you are the one who is the first to arrive at the scene of an accident. Whenever you are the one who forever finds herself caught up in duties, not of her own choosing, that always have you around when the best glamorous work needs to be done. Whenever you are the one whose plans and dreams can be sacrificed because everyone else's are deemed important. And to Ronald Rollheiser's suggestions, how appropriate it would be to add this one. Thinking of all of the doctors and nurses, the hospital workers who have to go into a room after the discharge of a patient, to scour down that room from top to bottom, to make sure that whatever viruses and germs that may be lingering are then disinfected, making the room ready to receive another patient. I'm thinking of all of the first responders, the medics, the firefighters, the police officers. These are all people who are being asked to sacrifice so that we can live healthfully and eventually gainfully. Whenever you're the one whose life is disrupted by unwanted circumstance, Ronald Rollheiser suggests, you are Simon of Cyrene, helping Jesus to carry the cross. What Ronald Rollheiser just did was to point out how similar Simon of Cyrene's situation of having had to get involved in a situation that he hadn't bargained for when he got up on that first Friday morning, comparing his situation to our own present-day circumstances. And no matter what his personal feelings might have been about the whole situation, the fact of the matter is that he did help Jesus to carry his cross, and thereby his name is forever engraved in history. All of Ronald Rollheiser's suggestions and my own reflections lead us to ask, what am I willing to do? What can I do 
even if it goes against the grain, even if it's inconvenient or difficult to do so. What can I do to help a suffering member of the body of Christ, especially now in these difficult and stressful days, to help them carry their cross? And this is where it is helpful for us to remember what we learned years ago in our Baltimore Catechism, or not so long ago, more recently, in the more modern, up-to-date catechisms that are used in our Catholic schools and in public schools to teach the rudiments of the Catholic faith. Wherever we learned our catechism, we remember what was called, what is called, the corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy. Practicing the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy are a very concrete way of helping someone to carry the cross, whatever shape or form that cross takes on in a person's life. We remember the corporal works of mercy, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, clothing the naked, sheltering the homeless, visiting the sick, visiting the imprisoned, and burying the dead. Of course, given the limitations on our ability to come and go as we please in these stressful days, practicing each or any or all of these corporal works of mercy might be more difficult in the actual concrete, in the actual practice, than we might like. But still, there are opportunities. For example, feeding the hungry. When we are preparing our grocery list, if we're in good enough shape to go out and do grocery shopping, perhaps the night before or the day of, we can call up a neighbor, a relative, an old person who might not otherwise have the opportunity to go grocery shopping for himself or herself to say, I'm going out shopping. Do you need anything? Can I get anything for you? Can I go to the drugstore to pick up your prescriptions? Many of us are already in the habit of visiting the sick, whether you're a communion minister or whether you have a family member or a loved one who is sick in the hospital. It's almost second nature for us to visit the sick. Now, with the restrictions on our mobility, it's becoming much, much, much more difficult. But the postal service still operates. The internet still operates. The telephone still operates. Perhaps we can send the sick a card. Perhaps we can be more diligent in picking up the phone to make a phone call. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you can use Skype or FaceTime to make video calls. When it comes to visiting the imprisoned, well, even in the best of times, it's never easy to get inside a prison to visit someone. However, again, this is where it's possible to send cards to replenish a prisoner's money account that they need to buy things from the commissary. All it takes is a little bit of imagination. We remember that when we practice the corporal works of mercy, we don't do so strictly on our own initiative. When we are inspired to practice a corporal works of mercy, it's because the Lord himself has initiated the invitation. He has sparked in us the divine flame of love. And he said to us, perhaps in the most vaguest of ways, he said to us, there's somebody who needs a call. There's someone who could use a card. There's someone who needs a prayer. So when we practice the corporal or even the spiritual works of mercy, we don't do it on our own strength or strictly on the basis of our own innate goodwill. We do it already because God has taken the initiative and given us the grace and the strength and the courage to do so. There are also the spiritual works of mercy that we can do. And perhaps these are easier to do in a practical way than the corporal works of mercy, because in a certain sense they require less physical strength. Remember the spiritual works of mercy. To admonish the sinner, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to comfort the sorrowful, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive all injuries, to pray for the living and the dead. Let's focus on just the last three for a moment. To bear wrongs patiently. What an opportunity is given to us right now to bear wrongs patiently. 
thinking specifically of the wrong, in quotation marks, that we are all experiencing right now. We didn't ask for, nor did we deserve, from any point of view, this crisis. It is imposed on us simply because it's in the nature of a virus to want to spread. It is something that is being done to us. And in that context of something that is being done to us, we need to exercise patience, to bear wrongs patiently. With regard to the spiritual work of mercy, to forgive all injuries, well, God only knows how many personal injuries have been inflicted upon us whether we've been the victim of malicious gossip or whether simply because we've been misunderstood or misquoted in a conversation, whether because our love in a marriage, in a proposed marriage, or even in a marriage, or in a friendship has been rejected. We can multiply and multiply and multiply examples of injuries that need to be forgiven. But perhaps a very prominent example of something that needs to be given occurs even now in the midst of this coronavirus crisis. We have all seen images on TV and in the newspaper of youngish people massing in hordes on beaches in California and in Florida, seemingly oblivious of the crisis that is unfolding around them. We need to forgive them. We need to say with Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They're so young. They don't know what life is all about. They don't know what we, the elders, know. And so, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We need to forgive the people who are not practicing social distancing guidelines when we see them in groups of more than ten, in whatever public place they may be. We need to forgive those people who seem to be totally oblivious of the pain and the suffering, especially the emotional suffering that so many of our brothers and sisters are undergoing because life has suddenly and dramatically taken on a new shape. We need to forgive one of the spiritual works of mercy. The last spiritual work of mercy invites us to pray for the living and the dead. What a cross it is that many of us are carrying these days by our inability to attend Mass on Sunday, to attend daily Mass, not to be able to receive the consolation of the Eucharist is a painful, painful cross for many, 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 many people. What an opportunity is given to us, however, in these days to join ourselves to televised masses, to tune in to EWTN, for example. They have a live mass first thing in the morning, and then that same mass is re-televised during the course of the day. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, just a few days ago, during the course of his noonday Angelus homily, gave the church an example of a prayer that he prays to make a spiritual communion. To be able to join in a televised Mass, whether it's the daily Mass here at the Shrine of St. Therese, whether it is the Sunday Mass that is being televised from your home parish, or to be united with the bishop as he celebrates Mass in the cathedral, or to be united with our Holy Father the Pope as he celebrates Mass from St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, or from the chapel of the Santa Marta house where he lives. When we join ourselves spiritually to those Masses and make a spiritual communion, we are opening up our lives and our hearts to receive a fresh outpouring of God's merciful love. And we receive the strength of the Eucharist to deepen our faith our hope and our love, to nourish us, to nurture us, to strengthen us and to give us courage, to make of us people of hope in a world, in a time and place right here and now that needs the message of hope 
based on the good news of Jesus Christ. When we join ourselves to these masses and make a spiritual holy communion, the graces are boundless. Another thing that we can do, and something that I have gotten into the habit of doing since the crisis began, is to join with one of my brother Carmelites who lives in the Czech Republic. And we've been joining together every day through FaceTime to say the rosary together. And we offer the rosary for the entire world and for whatever other particular intentions each of us have. We came together this morning to pray the Stations of the Cross. Even if you don't have Stations of the Cross in your home, I'm sure that many of you have prayer books and holy cards that have images of the Stations of the Cross. You can pray the Stations of the Cross and receive the same graces, the same spiritual benefits as though you were making the Stations of the Cross in a more solemn setting as you did this morning or as you have been accustomed to in the past. So as we come to the end of this day called Walk with Jesus, this Lenten day of reflection, I would like to conclude by reading a poem written by St. Therese of the Child Jesus. She wrote a poem called My Heaven on Earth. It was subtitled, A Canticle to the Holy Face. She wrote it on August 12th, 1895, and she addressed this poem to Sister Marie Agnes of the Holy Face. This poem was written just about two years, a little more than two years, before St. Therese passed into glory. It was written about two months after she wrote her most memorable poem, The Offering to Merciful Love. She wrote this poem shortly after the Feast of the Transfiguration, which occurs, of course, on August 6th. She wrote this poem on August 12th. Remembering, of course, that the language and the imagery may seem a bit saccharine to us, It's not the imagery, it's not the stylistic skills or the lack thereof that draws us to Teresa's poetry. We are drawn to her poetry because of the intensity of her spiritual insight. We are drawn by the example of the waves of love that must have been coming over her that must have been flowing in her and through her as she was composing this poem. This is what she wrote. Jesus, your ineffable image is the star that guides my steps. You know your sweet face is for me, heaven on earth. My love discovers the charms of your face, adorned with tears. I smile through my own tears when I contemplate your sorrows. Oh, to console you, I want to live unknown on earth. Your beauty, which you know how to veil, discloses for me all its mystery. I would like to fly away to you. Your face is my only homeland. It's my kingdom of love. It's my cheerful meadow, each day my sweet sun. It's the lily of the valley whose mysterious perfume consoles my exiled soul making it taste the peace of heaven. It's my rest, my sweetness, and my melodious lyre. Your face, O my sweet Savior, is the divine bouquet of myrrh. I want to keep it on my heart. Your face is my only wealth. I ask for nothing more. Hiding myself in it unceasingly, I will resemble you, Jesus. 
Leave in me the divine impress of your features filled with sweetness, and soon I'll become holy. I shall draw hearts to you, so that I may gather a beautiful golden harvest, deign to set me aflame with your fire, with your adored mouth, Give me soon the eternal kiss. Going back to stanza three, where she writes, Your face is my only homeland. It's my kingdom of love. Perhaps that's Teresa's way of consoling us right now. Teresa's way of reminding us that perhaps the best thing that we can do to cope with this trial that we're going through, to cope with the loneliness that it might entail, to cope with the restrictions on our mobility, to cope with the sense of spiritual loss by not being able to participate in the sacraments in the way that we are accustomed to, Perhaps the best way to help us cope is by fixing our minds on the holy face of Jesus. Remembering, as Therese says, that his face is our only homeland. His face is our kingdom of love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, and God bless you.